Today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. There are many heartwarming stories about the men who have devoted their lives to God, but none is more moving than that of Father Flanagan and Boys Town. Come with us now to Boys Town, Nebraska, and to their 353rd Military Police Company. He ain't heavy, Father. He's my brother. Father Flanagan's boy's home, Boys Town, a monument to one man's conviction that there are no bad boys. Located just outside of Omaha, Nebraska, Boys Town is a miniature model community which provides a haven for more than a thousand homeless, abandoned, or neglected boys. Here is a helping hand for those in drastic need. With more than 60 buildings spread over 900 acres of Nebraska's rolling countryside, today Boys Town has the facilities to provide the care and guidance its young citizens must have. It gives each boy a good education and the opportunity to learn a trade. It offers a healthy, active environment which encourages normal growth. This is a community of the boys, for the boys, and by the boys. Twice each year, they elect from their own ranks a mayor, four councilmen, and all the other town officials. Running their own town is part of their education. In this handsome modern trade school is a typical example. The boys who attend classes here acquire skills by which one day they may earn their living. At the same time, they make many useful items for their community, even while they are learning to use these tools. Almost all of the work required at Boys Town is done by the boys themselves. Young or old, each one contributes according to his talent and ability. Pitching in and doing the different jobs needed to keep the town going builds a spirit of teamwork. In the town's garage, the boys do many simple repair jobs themselves. But there is also a trained mechanic on duty to help them master the more complicated aspects of the internal combustion engine. Each boy has the opportunity to work in the area of his choice. In the radio television lab, engineers of tomorrow study electronics and at the same time keep their own radios and television sets in good repair. These are some young bakers. They assist in preparing the daily ration of bread, but their real delight is in the buns, the cakes, and the pies so dear to any boy's heart. Feeding a thousand growing boys is no easy matter. To provide the enormous amounts of milk, cream, butter, and beef needed for so many young appetites, Boys Town has its own farm. Here, youngsters who may one day have farms of their own can cut their agricultural teeth. For those who are interested, there is a beef club, a branch of the 4-H clubs, and a variety of farm activities, including preparing entries for local fairs. The boys are paid for all the work they do, the money going into a fund which they receive upon graduation. There are other benefits from this work. It teaches the boys about the land and its animals. The hard physical labor helps build strong bodies, and the apprentice farmers learn how to handle heavy machinery. The farm is run partially on an experimental basis, allowing the boys to try out new ideas of their own. While some of these youngsters may never be on a farm again, the knowledge they gain here will not be wasted wherever they may go. And of course, Boys Town isn't all study and work. Every boy is encouraged to have a hobby,
to express his creative interests. In addition to this arts and crafts center, there is a dramatic club, the famous Boys Town Choir, and many other self-expression groups. For having fun should be part of any normal boy's life. The boys also help manufacture models of the famous Boys Town symbol. These miniature statues are highly prized by visitors. Since young bodies need fresh air and exercise, there is always plenty of both. One of the great advantages of being raised in the country is that there is always room for pets. Most children love animals, and here almost every boy has a pet of one kind or another. Some say there are as many dogs as boys at the home. One tradition passed on from class to class is catching gophers. The boys know what they're doing, as you can see. In their own barber shop, the boys give more than a thousand haircuts every week. A neat, tidy appearance is required at Boys Town, particularly at Sunday church services. For although this is a non-sectarian institution, each boy must follow the religion of his choice. Faith and achievement move side by side. School, work, play, and religion forming well-rounded lives based on philosophy and character. Despite their youth, most of these boys are serious-minded. They have already met and conquered more difficult problems than most American boys their age. When they finally leave Boys Town, these youngsters will be mature and ready to face life. Each year on graduation day, the 18-year-olds leave the home. All of them know that they are eligible for military service. As young students of democracy and good citizens, they realize that this is an obligation they owe to their country. When in 1955, the National Reserve Act was passed by Congress, many boys requested that the home secure additional information for them about the Army Reserve Program. The boys who graduated in 1955 were too old to take part in the Reserve Program while still at Boys Town. But the younger boys, those who remained behind, were still eligible for the program. in physiology. To help the patient's defense mechanism combat the crippling effects of burns, new drugs and new methods are continually being investigated. biochemistry. A multitude of blood tests each day help correct blood deficiencies that follow burning. In the radioisotope section, here the true nature of the body's response to severe burning is being brought into sharper focus. Advances in patient care include pioneering in the use of exposure in burn wound treatment. And in methods for using donor skin grafts to save the lives of severely burned patients. Only skin grafted from the patient himself or his identical twin will be retained permanently on the wounds. But grafts from other bodies temporarily close the open wounds 
and serve approximately 30 days. By this time, the patient has improved sufficiently to withstand the cutting of grafts from his own body. He has shown photographic proof of his bettering condition. His improvement then becomes rapid and his morale keeps pace. Working with the army doctors, a skilled dietitian prepares the special diets needed by burn patients. Highly trained chefs prepare and serve them. In this case, a liquid meal is required containing the food elements which will help most in healing the burn wounds and speeding the patient's recovery from the ravages of his injury. But the mission of the unit embraces not only patient care and research, it also includes teaching. Classes consist of medical men from all the armed services. Air Force trainees serve and study for three months. And a Navy surgeon is detailed annually for one year of learning and operating. Care for the emotional life of the patient is part of his treatment and cure. His relatives and friends are welcomed, for their presence is medicine for his morale. No matter what his religion, the patient is encouraged to find in it the faith to sustain him through his convalescence. The patient, too, is made to feel that the hospital gladly receives his home folks as part of his restoration to health. He is encouraged to keep in touch with them. Recognizing that burns are the most devastating and frightening of injuries, the Protestant women of San Antonio have organized not only to comfort patients, but also those who come to visit them. Working with their chaplain, they bring religious faith to the burn victims and diverting activities to their saddened relatives. San Antonio's historic shrine, the Alamo, interests and relaxes the visitors. Over it flies the Lone Star flag. And at the entrance, the Alamo, 1718, mission, fortress, shrine, cradle of Texas liberty. So visitors forget their tensions and their more cheerful mood cheers and helps the patients. An example of burn treatment given servicemen's dependence is little Joyce West, here swathed in bandages under the bed covering and being comforted during her ordeal. She was cruelly burned in neck, body and thighs. Here is Joyce today, on the left, cured and happy after her horrifying experience. Her injuries, a few years ago, would have meant certain death. If atomic warfare is ever visited upon our country with its inferno of searing flame, the experience gained in the surgical research unit will contribute greatly to care of burn casualties and their rehabilitation. With its methods for rapid and effective burn therapy, Lives will be saved, suffering will be minimized. At a time when they are most helpless and most hopeless, the surgical research unit comes to comfort and heal the serviceman and his family. In Lincoln's words, to care for him who shall have borne the battle. Yes, 
and the serviceman and his family received this highest type of specialized medical skill at a time when nothing less will suffice to relieve suffering and save lives. Now our big picture cameras focus on what for them is an unusual subject. Another camera. The Army's new lightweight portable television camera. This camera is an example of just one more step forward in your Army's technological search for new equipment to do a better job in less time. At Fort Monmouth, combat television takes another big step into the future as men of the Signal Corps prepare to demonstrate the Army's new fully portable TV camera. The battery-powered transmitter weighs 47 pounds, the camera only 8. From each field camera, an image flashes to the monitor jeep where the desired picture can be selected for viewing. The electronic scout teams move out, completely free from the cumbersome cables which heretofore limited their mobility. The teams are composed of two men, a cameraman and a rifleman who also carries a handy talkie radio for communication with the monitor jeep. In demonstrating the capabilities of the new camera, the teams focus on prominent terrain features, such as this dam. The word is passed, and back at the monitor jeep, a key is punched, flashing what the camera sees onto the screen. Another button calls up the image of a traffic artery, which is being covered by a second camera team. Still another team waits by a railroad, to add its visual report to the others. From the Jeep, the electronic roll call goes out and is answered by images from each camera team in its turn. With the portable transmitter camera a proven practicality, Military leaders can look forward to the day when field commanders will receive instantaneous television reports on field conditions while they are developing from his electronic reconnaissance patrols. In the second week at Fort Carson, the company entered more advanced training. After several preliminary field exercises came a 12-mile march to an overnight bivouac. In a sharp military manner, the troops prepared to move out. Some of the boys were not sure that they could manage the full field packs. For when the rifles were slung, each boy was carrying over 70 pounds of rifle, tentage equipment, mess gear, extra clothing, candles, soap, and chocolate bars. The start was easy, packs high on their shoulders, and a quick, brisk pace. In the gray light of early morning, it was cool, and the mountains were covered with mist. Twelve miles had seemed long before the hike began, but with a steady pace, marching 50 minutes and resting 10, the company finally reached its destination. After dropping their heavy equipment at the bivouac area, the boys quickly found a place to freshen up. Before the field problems were to begin, however, the Army had scheduled something else. Both as a sample of another aspect of field living and in preparation for the strenuous work that lay ahead, religious services were held. The boys were accustomed to daily prayers at Boys Town. It impressed them that even here, religion was not forgotten and the services gave them a spiritual uplift. Again, the army was not so very different from Boys Town. After mass, the work began. Under the heat of a bright noonday sun, the boys pitched their camp and learned the first job of an infantryman, dig a foxhole. For while they are part of an MP company, Every boy must know basic infantry techniques. 
camouflage and concealment came next, together with instruction in infantry tactics and the proper use of terrain. By this time, marching from class to class seemed natural. The boys were delighted with the field training. Combat veterans of World War II told them war stories to illustrate the lectures. Tactics was the favorite subject. After the lectures, a special field problem was set up. The company simulated an attack against a hypothetical enemy. Keeping their heads down and their weapons up, they crawled forward towards the enemy's position, practicing what they had been taught. As the company moved up, individual squad leaders directed their men. In short spurts, the young soldiers rushed forward while others covered their advance with mock gunfire. As the boys crept ahead, this simulated attack captured their imaginations and they played their roles to the hilt. Throughout the problem, the cadre quickly corrected any errors. Some snaked forward, others lunged in the quick movements so traditional to the infantry. They took advantage of the terrain, crawling quietly through concealed areas out of enemy sight. Finally, as they neared their objective, one by one, they swept forward. Individual aggressiveness in the attack was high. These field exercises were the highlight of the boys' summer training. Two weeks of intensive discipline and instruction had transformed them from green trainees into well-disciplined, willing soldiers. And it had helped the boys themselves. When the bivouac was over and the long march back to camp was begun, the boys were proud of their accomplishments and esprit de corps was high. Now they marched with the easy rhythm of the infantry soldier, shoulders relaxed and a long swinging stride. Every boy had proven himself to be physically fit, capable, and disciplined. On their last day at Fort Carson, a final inspection was made of the company by an army officer from post headquarters. He found a neat, sharp military unit. In addition, he found that every boy had mastered the classroom instruction in the principles of military police work. Young soldiers, but soldiers nevertheless. When the inspection was over, the company was congratulated on the fine job it had done during its two weeks at the post. Summer camp was finished. Now came the long ride home. The trip back was a happy one. Inside the bus, the boys joked and sang. With the faintly nostalgic air of old soldiers, they reminisced about their training, the drilling, the field problems, the wonders of the Colorado countryside. When the bus finally arrived at Boys Town, and they saw the many familiar sights, it was good to be back. There was still one final formation. Hardened veterans of the Battle of Fort Carson piled out of the bus and quickly fell into ranks. The boys of Boys Town, good citizens, good soldiers. In a gentle breach of military discipline, Father Wegner passed among the boys, greeting each one and welcoming him back. Father Wegner is proud of the 353rd. As he said recently, I am grateful to the United States Army Reserve Unit for making this program possible at Boystown. And I convey my deepest thanks to the fine, outstanding officers of the Army Reserve who have given their time in training our boys and who have helped them in so many ways. God bless them as well as our boys. The boys of Father Flanagan's Boys Home, part of America's ready reserve, young citizens of whom the nation may well be proud.
over America, small groups of men are working together in Army Reserve units. These small groups, added together, make up the American Army, make up America. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen, inviting you to be with us again next week for another look at the big picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station. You too can be an important part of the Big Picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.